And here we are. Dave, here we are. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming to the Q&A today. We are so glad to have you here with us. This is the live Q&A with Dave Hunter, founder and owner of Crown Bees, and this is How to Harvest Mason Bees. So whether you are brand new to all of this or whether you've been doing this for years, we are so glad that you're here. It's good to be in community with all of you. So let's just quickly do a little bit of housekeeping. We are recording this. It will be posted to YouTube later, so you can refer back to this whenever you want to. Um, and we did receive some questions in advance, so thank you to everyone who was able to do that. That's really helpful. If you were not able to get your question in ahead of time, that's okay. You can just simply comment over on YouTube, and we will be watching those comments there and answering as many of those questions as we can. Uh, and you can always reach us after the fact if you think of something that you forgot to ask. So no worries there. Yeah, we're good at that. We are. We will follow up. We're also going to use some QR codes today. So if Dave is talking about a specific place on our website or a specific product that you can get, we will flash a QR code up so that you can go right to that page. And those will show up on the recordings as well. So if you don't want to do it right in the moment, you can always go back and check it out. And I think that's it. So Dave, hello. I'm going to send things over to you. Okay. But wait, before we go, um, this is Erica Olson. She um, handles our marketing and communications, brand new person here. And this is, um, if it goes really smooth, it's all her, it's all her doing. So if it doesn't go smooth, I get the blame. <laughs> <laughs> that's generous. Thanks. Yeah, I'm just yeah. here to moderate today. Ah, uh, okay. So um, just kind of the overall picture. Uh, why harvest? Okay, so when you've got, um, it, it's pretty simple. Bees will use nesting holes. Okay, uh, they love the right size. They they're they like to be next to each other in little condos. Um, when you aggregate a whole bunch of good things tightly together, um, you're aggregating a whole bunch of food. So whether it's all the pollen or the little larvae that are all in there, or or bees at this point, um, man, it's a big attraction for pests to move in. So if you do nothing, you just leave this, you know, your nesting house alone. Um, your bees will coexist with the pests. In the spring, as your mason bees are going out, the pests, a lot of them are just staying behind, whether it's pollen mites or chalk brood or Houdini flies, they're all just ho hovering around here. So the next year, as the bees will reuse these holes that are dirty, they're kind of feeding these pests and then the pests get even more. And so within three or four years, mostly you've got pests and a few bees will show up. And so um, uh, a simple analogy is if I gave you a dog and I never taught you how to feed it or groom it or clean up after it, that dog's not going to do very well. Same thing. We're going to try to manage a wild species and um, we think this, the industry is saying, ah, when you follow these couple little rules, you're going to do better. So there's the, why should we do this? Okay. Um, Erica, what's the first question to kind of get us started? Alrighty. Here's our first question. Do I have to open up all of my nesting materials? Um, no. Okay. Uh, we, We've changed. We've, you know, what we've tried to do is make things easy for you. Um, in the past, we've opened up everything just because it was easy to do. Um, but we invented this little thing called a cocoon finder. And when you look at these reeds, they they look relatively all of them are full, but ah, a lot of them um, look dark. And you really is it open? Or is there something in there? So when I take this little rod and I drop it into um, here. This says at the bottom of this reed, there's something down there. So I would open that. And as I'm going through these various uh, reeds, I see that the cocoon started back there. A lot of times the bee, eh, she did so many cocoons and then got eaten. Or that was the last of her life and she, she left. So um, using a cocoon comb, whether you're in this or inside um, bee tube and inserts, um, if you don't see any green, then you know then it's an empty hole so this just helps you not open things up 
All right. Thanks, Dave. Mm -hmm. Here is our next question. This person has a bee house from not ground bees from a different store and has bamboo. How do I open bamboo? Um, it's a very relevant question. Um, so if you just leave your bamboo house out there, argument two seconds ago was, ah, it's going to become just a big hub for, for killing bees. Um, this is a hunk of bamboo. And, and actually when they're making these houses, you'll notice the node is right in the middle. Sometimes there's nothing, there's no ends at all. So they're just cutting up bamboo and it's a very cheap product. Okay. Um, but bees will use the front side and, um, uh, our reed splitter, which we've put together has a, um, uh, it can cut through bamboo. So when I'm doing this, it's not, always, it's not always easy, but I can open up bamboo. And I'm typically trying to do it typically at the node, but with bamboo more at the face, I can get in there. Um, this is safe in the past. We've say, you know, we've said use a, a sharp knife and it's just, or a pair of pliers. It's a mess. This works. Um, if you don't want to go through this trouble, uh, we have a, I don't think we've got this prepped up for it, but um, in the spring, you can put your entire house with all the bamboo and everything, all the bees into it, into one of our bee guard bags and close it. We call this moving, you know, moving day. Whereas the bees will emerge, they're gonna come into a, a bag that you're just opening up once a day and the bees will climb out and you're just able to let them out, but they won't go back in and re-nest into this thing. So um, crack them open or uh, transition from there with this moving concept, house into a, a bag that you can see through it. That's our bee guard bag. And then you're letting them out. You're right, I did not prep the QR code for the bee bag today. I, but sometimes you have sometimes to have it. <laughs> And that can uh, take you just about anywhere. I also want to go back and show people the link for the Cocoon Finder yeah. because I was following along with what you were saying so raptly that I forgot to put that QR code up. So there it is, folks. Cocoon Finder. There is that QR code. Sorry about missing that cue. You ready for the next question, Dave? Yes, ma'am. All righty. I have tried to harvest my bees twice. But each time when I open the reeds, there are bee cocoons, but they are not hardy. They seem to disintegrate. They wouldn't survive a washing. Do you have any insight as to why this happens and what I can do to fix it? Um, I, I am correcting a company path. Years ago, everything was just the spring mason bee that used mud. And then we brought in the leaf cutter bee and it uses leaves. Um, and it left out the fact that uh, there's another, you know, a thousand species of cavity nesting bees. Uh, we've got a brand new, this is a cool little thing, Joe DeLugo in Washington State. There's all these little different species of bees that just show up here around us. And not all bees have hard cocoons. And so as you're opening, um, if it's, this is a build it and they chem, so if you haven't bought bees from us and, and you see things that have, you know, bees have used this as you're opening reeds up or your wood trays up or things you're, and you're, you're in there and you're finding something that's, um, it's larva form. Like it didn't, it's not, hasn't metamorphosed. Ah, that's a summer something. Okay. It's a bee, could be a wasp. Um, I would close it back up. If it's a reed, I might just kind of put it back together in a little rubber band and just kind of hold it there and know that this is, I would store this in my garage or shed, wouldn't wash it, wouldn't do anything to it. If it's fragile, let's not mess with things. Let's kind of learn what they are. And so when I have something unknown, um, I'm going to say maybe close things up um, and put them in a container into your garage or unheated you know, shed or something. And then um, in the summertime, you're now going to be playing. We'll talk with this in, in email. But in the summertime or springtime, you're putting these things out in a manner that, um, similar to these bee guard bags, that you're able to watch what's going out. And you're just now aware of this new bee that's you know used in your yard. And um, we're going to be working more with you to figure out, you know, what is it? We'll, you know, as we learn, we'll work with entomologists and try to figure out what could these things be, and then we'll add them to our website. So 
wonderful that whoever you are found this great insect could be a summer something could be a spring something could be a, a bee could be a wasp um let's explore together but i would you know not wash things let's not kill any um cool something that used your nesting holes okay now dave i can go on to the next question or mm -hmm. i know you wanted to cover um some unexpected things that folks might find when they're harvesting some pests etc oh, yeah, yeah. let's let's do that so um good point so as you um actually, as you're opening things up just very quick rundown um the reed splitter um i'm taking just a reed and putting the node in there's node versus the opening putting the node in down there and i'm just coming down enough that it cracks and then i'm twisting this thing and the reed comes apart to get inside in this one i have two cocoons okay um so reed splitter is a wonderful little tool uh if i have um b tube and inserts um if you don't have a lot of inserts maybe you can tear these things open quite easily take a pair of scissors and i'm going to just snip the end just a little bit and if i want to just hand roll um unwind this i'm able to do so fairly regularly you know it, it does it's a little bit or tool tip here or pro tip drop all pull all the inserts out drop everything into just um warm water um not hot not medium but warm water leave them in there for 10 minutes the heat isn't going to harm your bees any but about 10 or 15 minutes the glue dissolves on in your insert and you're now just pulling out strips of paper and you can have the bees in there for an hour i mean it's not gonna hurt it so if the if the glue hasn't fallen apart after 10 minutes wait 15 minutes but boy you're just pulling out strips of paper the cocoons are floating and it's really easy to get to um if you please don't do this okay if you only use the bee tube without the insert um parasitic wasps get through this real easy like we we frown on just using this um but if you drop this in about 20 minutes later the glue dissolves so this is um you know you could do it that way and then with wood trays um you've opened these things up um uh, we've got a nice little device called the cocoon comb that you're simply um scraping cocoons out as you're going so it's a very simple device um both leaf cutter trays and mason bee trays are are both um in here doing this so it's you know we're trying to think through what we can do for you um okay so you've been doing this and you've got everything all the cocoons and debris inside just a, a lunch box or a box on your, whatever you've done there's a mess in front of you okay what could be in that mess um there's gonna be a lot of um cocoons okay cocoons are easy to find um you're gonna find mud debris around um if you could show a couple of what's the first picture look like these are all pests um you're gonna find around the cocoons black little specks so before that we don't have it at all erica um um bounce up a slide if you can I wonder what's on there uh yeah see um on the end of that cocoon i can't use my mouse but um there's gonna be little black you can see little black lines in there that's um mason bee poop. yeah i mean that's fine um you'll find that's the cocoon to the left of that is the pollen mite um but you're gonna find cocoons mud and then one of these first pests is uh pollen mites and a mite's job they just eat pollen so when the when the mason bee has gathered their pollen from their nesting um from the flower pollen mites are just piggybacking in and as the bee lays off that pollen they're scraping the pollen mite right into a pile of food what's better than that okay and that pollen mite just consumes all of the pollen in front of our mason bee and it's just stuck between two little chambers of mud and that's what that orange stuff is actually the orange stuff is their feces there if you take a microscope it's a cool little pink something that um with little legs that that go out like this um and okay back up one slide erica 
Okay, chalk brood. This is um, this used to be. It's a big deal. Um, this is a spore that uh, similar to a mushroom. It's when you when you find this and you touch it, the outer outer skin is friable. So the inside is an old cadaver that was a larva that died, and then this mushroom type stuff expanded past that larva. So it's real friable. When this sits there in the path, this um, chalk brood. A mason bee is going to go past it. It's going to get on her fur. She's going to carry it down the end of her tube. It's going to get under the flowers, under the front of her mason bee house. And so this then spreads and spreads. So years ago, before we could get um, our handle with this, we would have this between maybe 5% of our bees that would just spread everywhere. It's on our equipment. It was ugly. Um, treat this with care. If you find this, um, the best source to kill this is our, um, uh, you could use bleach. We kind of frown on putting caustic stuff next to cocoons. Our clean bee product um, does kill chalk root. And so when you're putting, when you find this in um, wood trays, laminates, you're actually taking the um, cadaver out, that chalk root spore out, and then just spraying this judiciously in that little hole because it's just concentrating there. I would just be careful if you've got this in all of your um, cocoons. The tail end, yeah, I'd be washing things and I'd be I'd be clean be spraying on this. It's a if you find chalk root, it's a big deal. Okay, and the best way to get rid of this is to harvest. Okay, that's the front end. There's nothing you can do about it but harvest. Okay, next slide is the pollen mites. Um, and the answer on pollen mites is, um, uh, right, yep, next slide. Okay, so um, the first side is um, they started off as little larva, uh, little little tiny guys in there. You can do nothing about it. They, they live in your yard, okay? Um, about uh, later on in the spring, they change from a little tiny thing you can't see to big old mites that are um, the piggyback between the wings of your bees and so as the bee goes out to they can be covered up i i had a tray of pollen mites years ago i mean just full of gross things and i dropped a couple bees into it and they're just they're on their antennas it was just mean it was a mean science experiment okay um I hear that story dave oh my gosh i know it's horrible okay but um but the bees were able to groom most of it off they couldn't get between their backs and about four or five days later um, all of the pollen mites are just falling off into the pollen masses out in my yard, all of the pollen and all the bees were just clean. So it's not going to kill them. It's just, this is the piggybacking and, and this is how they, this is how the pollen mite is teeming with the mason bee to live. Okay. Nothing you can do. Next one. Um, parasitic wasps, there is something you can do here. Um, wait, on the pollen mite, the best solution for that is to harvest, providing clean nest and holes. On the um, parasitic wasp, this wasp, um, that top picture, she's got a long ovipositor. She can put through um, pretty easily through paper tubes. And she, what she does is um, the mason bee's already done her work inside there. Um, she, the, the parasitic wasp taps with her um, antennas and walks all the way down there and finds out how she feels where the larva is, sonically, whatever puts her ovipositor and she lays a whole bunch of eggs next to the larva, okay? And <laughs> those little eggs, they, um, they, they hatch, they become little larva. They typically wait till the mason bee has finished its cocoon and then just, they've already injected, they're in it. And then, so they've eaten the whole mason bee and they're in a cocoon. Wow, okay? And they sometimes will chew right out. Um, I've got, uh, I didn't, this but um sometimes you'll see on paper tubes that are unprotected um this little tiny hole right there okay you can see the parasitic wasps that was their exit hole on that piece um you'll know they're there and then um the only other solution to if you've got this um you can put your um when you get your cocoons wet so now they haven't exited and this mono, this little wasp is inside this, you know, Trojan horse. You can get your cocoons wet. And if you put them on a real bright light, like an LED light, um, you can see through. And if you see a whole bunch of little 
um, things, if you're looking through the cocoon versus one thing, one thing would be a bee, a whole bunch of little things would be the wasp, okay? Or easiest, um, if in May, um, some of your cocoons haven't opened up, that's more than likely has, it's probably a pest something. And in May, um, we'll teach you in, in B-mail what to do, but you can you can dispose of those cocoons or you can open up a pair of scissors and find these little gross things in there. Okay, but the best way to handle this is, um, we see them show up if you only used an insert, not a good idea. If you only used a B-tube, not a good idea. Um, B-tube and inserts is thick enough and we think it, it messes up the vibrations. And then um, reeds are, you never, I never find them in a reed. And then uh, wood trays uh, that are tightly bound is another good path. The plastic trays out there people sell, um, mono just runs through them. So um, it's a pest that you handle mostly through harvesting. Okay, and the last one um, is the Houdini fly. Um, it overwinters as sticky, gross larva. And that lower picture there is what you'll find. And their frass, their poop is is sticky and, and brown. It's, just a, it's a mess. And okay, it's a mess. Um, the only way to tackle this right now is to remove these things, squish them, put them down the garbage disposal, do something. You know, we don't want these things surviving. Um, they, in their adult form, this is in uh, early April around the Washington area, it looks like a fly just like that, with these big red eyes, real slow, you can smush them. Um, but the source of the vector of this is your neighbor's yard that they don't care. So whoever has the mason bee house that they're not caring about that's where these bees are are the flies are uh, coming from and they're all in the seattle way covering portland oregon um uh, now bc so vancouver the whole mess in bc everyone's getting this fly and people have been shipping uh, unopened tubes out to the east coast we know they're out in new york new jersey connecticut pennsylvania so it's just spreading everywhere um and okay, lastly, um, we're teaming with the USDA. We have, we've got funding. So this coming spring, we're working with the USDA to hopefully come up with either an attractant, go into a sticky trap or a detractant. Um, don't bug my bees, but go get the neighbors. Um, so those- The saga continues. The saga can, we, as we learn, as we humans do things we're not supposed to do, um, we're, trying to help crumbies is trying to help you out so um yeah. okay so that was kind of what you can find and if you don't find those things um going to our website under um how to raise a bee mason bees um i think you'll find in there things you find in a um uh, there's a picture something there, there's a whole lot of there's moths and there's a whole bunch of stellas there's a whole bunch of other grubby gross things that are um part of nature trying to survive off your bees and your pollen in your yard so it's like you know i want bees i don't want pollen mites so i'm going to try to get rid of those to keep this it's um it's an adventure and it isn't that bad most of the time you're finding you're finding just cocoons but be prepared there's some other gross things in there next question erica all right this question, let's see. All right, I'm very comfortable with mason bees and have been harvesting them for several years now, but any other bee really throws me for a loop. If I open up a tube that has another bee in it, I just sort of roll it back up and stick it somewhere outside because I don't know what to do. How can I do better for these other bees? As crown bees continues to learn, I don't think that's um, a bad practice to do. Um, when I find, um, we were talking about earlier, when I find something I don't recognize, around here we have um, bees that use tree resin, pollen, you know, pollen nectar, laid an egg and there's tree resin. 
God, when I try to open things up, it's just a mess. And and there's we don't really find any pests in there. I would just leave the full tree resin tube alone. Um, when they use wood trays, yeah, they're glued together. Um, I think that's a good practice. Uh, I still would take them out of the environment. So where birds in the wintertime are hungry, would be pecking at the um, ends. I would put your house, your things that you're unsure of, into a container. I put them into a bee guard bag to maybe keep the little pests out and just keep it kind of mouse proof. Um, there's a lot of good things to eat in there and, and rodents will chew through the sides of reeds and stuff to get to the thing. So just in a protected something in an unheated garage or shed. So it's, it's a great question. And as we learn, we're going to be learning along with you. Okay, super. We have one more question here. This person asks, this is the first time that leaf cutter bees have used my mason bee house. How do I handle these when I'm harvesting my cocoons? Um, so we've also learned the, the leaf cutter bees that we sell are a summer insect. And so we would be harvesting um, those in the spring and we'd handle you know how to work with them and incubate them, et cetera. If you're finding leaf cutter bees that are um, in the spring, they're out here in Washington State, they're across the country, um, I certainly wouldn't wash them. If I find leaf cutter bees, I would um, pull them apart and put them in, you know, I, I wouldn't mind harvesting them, but I would keep them in a separate container. And in the spring, uh, this is where they're going to, if it's a spring something, they're going to come out and you'll let them out. Um, I would keep, protect them, keep them in a, like a bee guard bag. If it's a summer something, then uh, we'll work with you on, oh, well, nature will work. And the, and the bees typically will take the early summer heat to change from larva to adult bee and then come crawling out in June or July. So uh, don't wash. Um, when you find these, I would uh, expose and protect. Okay. Great segue to the next question, which is about storage over the winter. So this person says, I typically store my cocoons in the fridge in a humidifier case, but they don't seem to thrive in the spring. I've also noticed that sometimes the cocoons appear dehydrated or might get moldy. Would it be better to store them outside or in the garage? Um, when in doubt, nature has it figured out. Okay, so why would you put your bees in a refrigerator? Okay, um, global warming is is creating a mess. Um, let's just to, to answer this technically, um, your spring bees about now are adult bees, and their fuel tanks, their stored fats in their abdomens, are a hundred percent, and through the winter. They're just slowly consuming those stored fats till the springtime. Um, they've burnt off enough of these or consumed enough of these. So when their fuel tanks are maybe 10, 15% and it's warm outside, that times them to head out. Okay, that's normal. Take global warming. Now, global warming has things hotter. So your falls are hotter. Um, the bees are sitting there waiting for a nice fall weather and it's super warm. They're consuming fats really fast. Their metabolism, their metabolism is high. Their consumption of fats are high. So they're going to be starting to push through their fats quickly. In the springtime, we find a lot of times nowadays that you're getting really warm moments. And with these warm moments, the bees are saying, well, gosh, I'm at you know 15 or 20 percent. Let's head out. And they're coming out to snow, no flowers or anything, and then they're just dying. And so what we're very much in my whole industry is recommending is that we, for the bees that we're raising, okay, not every bee that you raised is staying in your little nesting holes. They're out inside your yard. So nature's working with those ones out there. The ones that you're trying to raise, uh, we would keep them in a refrigerator cold. Their metabolism is low. Their consumption of fats are slow. Okay, so we're then saying keep them in a fridge or, or a cold garage. The mason bee, and they live up in, in 
Saskatchewan. You know, it's it's minus ten Fahrenheit. You know, they're hardy little insects. They're an insect. It's not you and I. So you could keep them outside. Um, in a humidity, bee, um, when you store your bees in a modern frost refrigerator, they're out there dehydrating things. That's why we have crisper drawers. And this um, container, simple little something, little tablespoon of water in there. You've got your cocoons in there. This is keeping things tight. Um, there's a little airflow. We've got little holes on the top. Um, uh, true fact, in your fridge, you know, my wife and I, we try to clean our refrigerator out. But mold comes from something. It's floating in the air and lands on surfaces. And it'll get through these little holes and wind up on a cocoon. And, man it becomes moldy. Okay, the answer is real simple. Um, if this happens, you're just taking your cocoons out, you're cleaning them off in, in cold water. I would use, um, I would use Clean Bee. Uh, it kills mold spores. I would just spray them on that. Uh, make sure you wash all the pads and everything. Um, once I've closed this back up, I would now, since I know there's mold in my refrigerator, I'd put this in just a um, lunch sack and seal it. And so you've still got the humidity going on inside here, and um, you're keeping the mold spore from coming through the sack into this. Um, really low cost. These are um, humidity, um, temperature, humidity, little checks. We have them, I mean, it's really low cost. I would just place that in there. And if you're keeping your humidity above 30%, you're fine, okay? It's just a good visual check. Okay, great. Um, we are going to need to start to wrap up. Mm -hmm. um, I want to remind everyone that this video is going to be posted to the YouTube channel as a recording, so it's available on demand whenever you want to go back and revisit any of this information. Um, I'm going to share the QR code for the quick reference, Harvesting Mason Bees, so folks can go back there and look at all the information we have on our website. Um, and. Dave, do you have any closing words before we close out here? Um, no, this is, um, for us, this is the the start of the season. It's like, mm. and when you hold cocoons in your hands, just, oh, it's just the smell of, of healthy mason bees. I hope um, I like this industry, and so I, I look forward to harvesting. And if you guys have any um, extra cocoons, share them with friends. I would do that first, share them with you know friends and family just to kind of spread the word what's going out. Um, help them learn where to learn information. So crown bees can be a source of, of that. And then if you have still too many, um, we have a bee buyback program where uh, we'll give you cash for cocoons or store credit so you can buy new things. Uh, we're here to team with you. And we have bees from New York and the Dakotas and, and you know Northwest that come into us we hold them separately and as in the springtime as people are ordering bees from us we push those same bees back to the dakotas or to pennsylvania so we're very careful um bee buyback is um uh where we get a lot of our cocoons so help us uh we'd love to have that and um erica thank you this no flaws um, <laughs> thank you dave this appreciate was running through this <laughs> I know everyone's going to love getting all this info and whatever they can't find here, just to remind everyone, you can always find us, you can find info on the website and you can always shoot us your questions.